Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us for the second webinar in a three-part series that will explore topics in dexterity and hand skills and tonight tooth preparation. Um, it's sponsored by our, our friends at NSK who have brought to us this evening a really great speaker, Dr. Bob Lowe, uh, an authority in every sense of the word, uh, a gentleman who has lectured at Podia around the globe, uh, certainly domestically, internationally, published author, textbook contributor, and a, a hell of a dentist and a, and a really good gent, a talented operator who's gonna bring you some uh, insights this evening. And we thank him for, for his time and, and joining us and allowing us to bring you this great information. Um, just a few housekeeping items before I introduce and let Dr. Lowe kick things off officially. We're going to have about a 45 minute didactic session where he's gonna present some of these concepts that you'll be looking to implement in your clinics your chair in the future, et cetera. Uh, if you have any questions, you can queue those up in either the chat window or the Q&A. And at the end of that 45 minute session, I'll queue them up for Dr. Lowe and we'll cover as many of those as we have time for this evening. Um, at the conclusion of that, we're going to do a, a brief survey. So I hope you'll stick around and share your thoughts. We're gonna use that just to help plan some future activities like this. And uh, we're gonna draw one person at random who can participates in that survey and if you're a, um, a contributor in that way we're going to draw somebody at random and present an iPad for your insights. Um, lastly we're going to have a couple of polls in the middle of the, the discussion and hope you'll share your feedback there as well. We're just looking to get a feel for some of your background in tooth preparation, removing of existing restorations and with that said it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening Dr. Bob Lowe. It's a pleasure to be here. As Rich has said, uh, uh, we've known each other for uh, for many years, uh, going back through. Uh, we don't want to actually admit how many, uh, but uh, um, the next DDS, the new dentist, the young dentist. I always uh, ask people in my my lectures every week, when was that day that you woke up? and you realized you were no longer one of the young guys or ladies, but you were now one of the old guys. I can't remember when that happened, but I tell you, it seems like graduation was yesterday, but yet it was over 30 years ago. So it's a pleasure and an honor. Rich mentioned a lot of things. I've, I've, I've uh, uh, worked at hard over the course of those three decades. One thing I also did was I, I taught uh, full-time at Loyola University School of Dentistry in, in operative and restorative for 10 years between 85 and, uh, 83 and 93. So I can uh, share with you some insights from uh, uh, both sides of di the didactic floor and from the, the clinical uh, aspect as well. Keys to tooth preparation for direct and indirect restorations. What can I say? Bread and butter dentistry starts with excellent preparation. I lecture to a lot of very uh, older dentists. I lecture to a lot of older dentists and younger dentists, varying degrees of skill and expertise and experience. And when it comes to preparation, it's amazing the uh, uh, a lot of feedback that I get, well, why, why do you spend time talking about that, Dr. Lowe? We know how to do that already. That's what we go to school for. But yet when you ask the laboratory technicians, you know, about the preparations that they're getting in the lab to create restorations, I, I think we all, including myself, can learn because we deal in a profession where a tenth of a millimeter means the difference between success and failure. So hopefully I can share some of those keys and insights with you tonight, and it will help whatever you're doing turn out better and, and have better clinical outcomes. Now, Rich, I, I don't know. You have to you have to be in it to win it. Uh, um, <laughs> you, you, we're hopefully listening to a great speaker sharing that great information. Um, Rich did uh, mention to you about the survey and in winning the iPad. Rich, do I get a chance to win that iPad? I think it will take care of you one way or the other. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's all right. But uh, dispensing with the accolades, actually, uh, looking at that picture and looking at the live feed, you can see that the camera adds more than 10 pounds. Um, I think I need to work on <laughs> Photoshop a little bit. But uh, the art and science of dentistry. 
I was fortunate when I was a dental student to uh, be growing up in the dental industry in Chicago. I'm originally born and raised in Chicago. I lived there, went to school there, practiced there until 2000, and then moved to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, where the winters are a little bit more genteel, and have practiced here in Charlotte, North Carolina for uh, uh, over 17 years. But we practiced the art and science of dentistry, and when I grew up and was a dental student, uh, I was fortunate to meet a mentor, a Dr. Harold Chevelle, who was also lecturing and teaching at the highest level at that point in his career, and talking about the uh, the aesthetics of the uh, hard tissues and soft tissues, and and how you know aesthetics and form and function are are combined in in uh, in almost like uh, uh, cinematic beauty uh, to really give us a profession and the ability to impact on a patient much farther than you know taking out a cavity and filling in a hole. So hopefully this will help inspire you as well because it really is all about the patient, the experience, and the outcome. Nature provides a blueprint for us, and the blueprint is specific. We are the restorative dentists. We're responsible for following that blueprint. Notice these natural teeth with all the subtle nuances of of elevations, depressions, sulci, grooves, cuspal forms, parabolic forms, transverse ridges, marginal ridges, all those things you learn in oral morphology. Yet when you see a lot of dental restorations today in clinical practice, those restorations don't really follow that blueprint. Part of the reason that's so is because of preparation design. And we're gonna talk about that in detail this evening in our webinar. First of all, mentioning isolation techniques. In dental school, we are quote unquote drilled upon isolation with the rubber dam. And here's a, an operative case where we're gonna do a diastema closure and an adhesive procedure, which means we need to have isolation from the oral environment, from from uh, possible contaminants of blood and saliva so that we can have an optimal uh, restorative result using uh, a resinous-based material. So rubber dam has always been a standard which we could use as isolation to keep the patient's tongue and cheeks and saliva and fluids out of the way and keep the operative area um, relatively available for us to do our best operative and fixed dentistry. There have been forms of isolation that have been developed that uh, are of use in clinical practice. One of these is what you see here pictured in isolite. An isolite is a combined bite block, illumination device, and isolation device that within a, a couple of seconds can be placed and isolate an upper and lower quadrant and allow you to do your preparation uh, it uh, also helps occlude the, the airway, so it protects the airway when you're removing restorations such as amalgam, gold, or crowns. When you're doing bonding procedures is in the center, it keeps the saliva and the tongue out of the way to keep moisture at its bay so that you can do an adhesive procedure successfully, fully cure, and finish. Studies have shown that um, these types of isolation techniques do actually um, do as good a job as uh, our traditional isolation with rubber dam as far as um, oral humidity and moisture control. So let's look first at early diagnosis and co conservative treatment of dental caries. Is there a concern over hidden caries? This is one topic that uh, I feel strongly about and lecture about quite a bit because uh, as you see is uh, from the picture on the, the left, uh, that uh, molar, is that a stain or is it a cavity? Is it decay? Do we treat it or do we not treat it? Is there radiographic evidence of any lesion? Well, when we look at the uh, picture on the right of this tooth sectioned, we see a fairly aggressive lesion. You know, we remember from karyology that pit and fissure decay starts very incipient in the deep pits and fissures, spreads to the DEJ and then goes laterally, and an inverse triangle spreads toward the pulp rather quickly because of the nature of dentin. 
So early diagnosis, I feel, is critical. And diagnosing with only an explorer, is that really the best way? Here we have three different clinical situations, different patients. Number 15, occlusal pit, 31, occlusal pit, 18, occlusal pit. Uh, number 15 and 31 are slight sticks. I, I don't know what a slight stick means. What's a slight stick? Is it a slight cavity? Is the tooth slightly pregnant? I don't know. Uh, it, it's either got decay or it doesn't. So what's your choice? Do you drill? Do you restore? Do you watch? Do you let it get bigger? In a day where most people are living well into their 80s, don't you want most people to have their teeth when they I certainly do. So putting a big dog bone extension for prevention cavity preparation in might not be the answer. Also, watching a cavity, a small cavity, get bigger till we justify putting a bigger hole in the tooth, also not the answer. What's the patient's caries risk assessment? Do they have a lot of fillings already? Do they know which end of the toothbrush has the bristles? We have to ask these questions because we're the doctors. It's not just cut and dry. What does your patient want? I ask this question every week. Do you still diagnose pit and fissure decay like Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble's dentist? Now, for, for the younger dentists who don't know who Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble is, those were cartoon characters from the Stone Age that we grew up with in the 60s. The dental explorers from the Stone Age. When the dental explorer has been put into an autoclave several thousand times, it's no longer an explorer. It's a blunt probe. So do we really rely on that to give our patients the best diagnosis for the best clinical outcome? Dark stained pits, no sticks, drill or not to drill. Now, a diagnostic dent is something that's been around for a long time. It, it measures the degree of decalcification. It's a quantification of decalcification. Diagnostic has been available to the profession for probably about 20 years. Yet when I ask how many people are clinically using it, I would say maybe 10%. A reading over 30 indicates decalcification. So if a patient has a single pit and 130, maybe I'll watch it till the next recall. If the number goes up, I recommend that we restore. If a patient has several teeth that already have fillings in, they don't know which end of the toothbrush has the bristles, and they only come in when something hurts, and they have a tooth that has a reading of a 35, I'm going to recommend restoring. Be the doctor. Here's a 64. Here's a 31. Here's a 38. You be the judge. Use the clinical criteria. Make a good, good clinical decision. Minimal preparations can now be done with fissurotomy birds. We don't have to use a 699 or 557, the bird that we learned with in operative dentistry in 1978, Loyola University School of Dentistry, cutting my first dog bone extension for prevention cavity preparation on tooth number 19 for a small little occlusal pit in the central sulcus, making a big preparation, cutting away 90% a healthy tooth to restore a small little carious pit. We don't have to do that anymore. The decision, in my mind, is to treat early, preserve tooth structure. We have restorative materials today that are bioactive materials that help replenish lost minerals. We'll talk about those. Because these fissurotomy preparations can be small. What about that? Is it decay? Is it a stain? Do you treat? Do you not treat? Well, we're going to talk about early diagnosis. We're going to talk about other diagnostic tools, carious fluorescence, using um, specialized cameras with filters that allow us to detect early bacterial stain and, and, and differentiate it from, uh, not bacterial stain, but differentiate stain from bacteria or active decay. And then we can remove that area only and restore instead of making this big preparation that we were taught by, God rest his soul, Dr. Black. Here we see our patient undergoing a fissurotomy in tooth number uh, 19. Uh, sometimes this is an enamel and can actually be done with no anesthetic, very comfortably. I'm using an electric handpiece. I like electric handpieces because I can control the RPMs on some of these delicate procedures. I also have uh, 
air turbine hand pieces for gross reduction and sound preps. I use both. Here are some finishing burrs to finish composite restorative material. I like carbide burrs because we get good surface texture. We start with a 12 blade to contour and a 20 blade to polish. And that's what we're doing on our patient here. We placed our restorative material. And uh, going first with a 12 blade, followed by a 20 blade to pre-polish the restorative material. Once the restorative material is placed, polishing, you can see the, the tooth on the right is the restored tooth. My challenge to you is show me where the filling is. Show me where the restoration is. Conservative preparation because of early diagnosis, minimal preparation, and restoration. There are two other examples, preoperatively with stains and upper first and second molars. Preparation is completed, restoration is finished. Now, in today's world of heavy body flowable resins, a lot of times these very small restorations can be performed with a flowable composite. But really, the preparations are too small to fit even the smallest condenser. Occlusion is not happening directly on those areas. You can always check where the occlusion is happening by preoperatively checking with articulating paper to see where the occlusal stops are. Early diagnosis using decay fluorescence shows us exactly whether those stains in the groove are stains or if it's active decay. These visuals are very powerful to the patient as well. Much more powerful than saying, oh, I think I got a stick. I think you have a cavity. I show my patients on a 46 inch monitor. We do a tooth by tooth examination. And these areas, it's, well, that's never going to get any smaller. Now, if you had a melanoma on your hand, would you want it taken off when it was the size of a pinpoint? Or do you want us to watch it grow to the size of a grapefruit and then take it off? <laughs> Choice of yours. Now, this is dental caries. I don't want to make light of that, but as I tell my patients, this decay will never be as conservatively removed as it will be if we do it now. Look at these preparations. They're minimal, minimal preparation to remove early decay. So Rick, here's a fast poll. What's All the right. poll? Do I, do I get involved with this or are you just gonna ask a question and look for I'm gonna answers? open the poll up to everybody right now. We're gonna talk a little bit more about fixed prost tonight. So let's talk about the type of finish line. Let's, let's talk about prosthodontics. Let me see your replies, everybody. I'm gonna open the poll and just leave it open briefly. We've got a lot of material to go through. Let's see interested uh, and I will display the results on screen just in a few moments. And we will be talking about fixed prost and I will mention finish lines. Yeah, absolutely. Because finish line is predicated on the restorative material being used. So depending upon what your preference is, be careful that you're using a material that warrants that type of finish line. Got a couple last minute comments coming through and then I'm going to shut the poll down and let Dr. Lowe get back to it. Just one moment more folks the strong leader in the clubhouse about 18 seconds to go are you going to show the result now or are we going to wait for you that? bet it's going to shut down in about 10 seconds then we'll show it on screen some last respondent answers coming through somebody's flashing up here that's saying no audio i i don't know about that I can help with that in just one second. Okay. All right, so chamfer, the overwhelming popular choice here among all the folks. Between chamfer and shoulder, or a shoulder chamfer, which uh, uh, pretty much uh, if you're looking at uh, all ceramic, high strength ceramic like Emacs, um, these are materials that require that, you know, Ceramic in general doesn't have good edge strength, so knife edge would be out unless you're talking about gold. Little so it is really packs. predicated on material. So shall we continue? 
Yes, sir. All right. Let me see if I can find my button again here. We're going to continue with that fissurotomy and then move into fix because I think it's important to differentiate. On the right, you see a fissurotomy burr that's designed for minimal tooth removal to gain access to uh, early detected carious lesions versus a typical 330 or other type of burr that's commonly used to cut a more extensive preparation that not only takes out the decay but removes a lot of healthy tooth as well. Now, when we talk about the restorative materials, one thing that I'm a big proponent of is bioactivity. We have bioactive restorative materials available to us now. Traditional restorative materials fill the void, fill the cavity, but don't nourish the tooth, don't replenish the lost calcium and phosphate that has been lost due to demineralization from the bacterial byproducts of metabolism, that being acid. We have some restorative materials now that help buffer that acid to make that acid less active and less dangerous. We have some materials that replenish calcium and phosphate ions to tooth structure that's been partially demineralized that hasn't really turned into infected dentin yet. So biomineralization today, in my mind, is much more than fluoride release. It involves the exchange of calcium and phosphate ions to help form or reform appetite building block of tooth. Restoring the fissurotomy preparations that you saw previously with a, a composite material, this is a gyomer. The, a gyomer restorative has a glass filler that is coated with glass ionomer and several other ions. And these ions are released to the microenvironment, which produce a basic effect or base, basic pH helping to neutralize acids from bacterial attack. So it's a smart material. Checking occlusion and making adjustments with the 12 fluid and 20 fluid of burr, and then using uh, rubber polishing uh, armamentarium to polish in deep into the grooves. We find restored teeth here that if you just look at that picture, I think it would be hard to find the restorative material. Yet decay has been detected in its earliest forms. The preparation has been minimalistic, conserving healthy tooth structure, and the restoration has been made with a bioactive material to help protect and preserve the integrity of the dentition. If some of this decay gets down to dentin, we have burrs that are self-limiting. These are smart burrs. They're polymer burrs. They're made to a new part of 90, which removes only infected dentin and not healthy dentin. So we can limit the amount of healthy tooth structure, again, that's removed when we're doing excavation in the dentin, such as you see here. We open up these little pits. Is this decay or not? Well, obviously this was. This was detected with a diagnodent. Same thing here. So once the decay is excavated, these areas can be etched and bonded using a uh, restored material and then restored. So let's look at tooth preparation in fixed pros. And I basically follow two different preparation designs. This is what I learned in school, although I've, I've adapted this for modern materials. When I was in dental school, we had gold and PFM. Now we've got a lot of different materials. But I will tell you, each material, regardless of your restorative choice, you need to provide the space for the technician to provide a uniform thickness of material for strength and allow the technician to develop the proper anatomic form to the restoration. We're restoring teeth, not flat tops, not non-anatomic marbles. So you have to have enough space for the material to perform. Posterior, occlusal reduction, I don't care what the material is except for gold. If you're talking about a full gold crown, you can cast gold to a half a millimeter. Any other material, in my opinion, requires a millimeter and a half, two millimeters of space. Anterior and sizal reduction, at least a millimeter to a millimeter and a half. Now, the two preparations, the first one, the axial reduction being greater than a millimeter, we have our traditional PFM, which we need 1.5. We 
We have press ceramics, uh, such as Empress, which has now been replaced by Emacs, which also need more than one millimeter. Aluminous porcelain, uh, which is still used, but not as frequently. Uh, and zirconium. Now, some will say you can use zirconium like gold and prep a lot less aggressively. Uh, I'm not so sure that there's enough evidence to support that. So for right now, I'm prepping for zirconium as I would for a conventional PFM. Preparation design two, occlusal reduction and sizal reduction exactly the same, the axial reduction being less than a millimeter. CapTech is a porcelain fused metal that's a specialized material because the copings are thinner and it doesn't need opaque, so it requires less space. It's also a material that has some biologic capabilities because it, it's been shown through studies to repel plaque because of a lower surface free energy uh, of the uh, composite metal. So in a, a patient with uh, periodontal issues, again, that doesn't know which end of the toothbrush has the bristles and you're restoring subgingival margins, uh, it's a good choice in those patients. Stacked porcelain is your traditional porcelain veneer. Laboratory process composite, dentistry's forgotten stepchild, still what I think is a very good material. These all require less than a millimeter of axial reduction. Now, a couple of things about preparation that's not taught in school. The biologic aspect. How many people sound when they prepare teeth? What is sounding? Sounding is measuring from the free gingival margin to the crest of the bone by pushing the periodontal probe on an anesthetized patient down to the alveolar bone. Because based on studies, we should have a millimeter at least of sulcus and then two millimeters of attachment before we hit the crest of bone. If the preparation margin goes closer to the crest of bone than three millimeters on the facial, four on the interproximal on the anteriors, and three millimeters on the facial, and three millimeters on the proximal on posteriors, we run into concerns of invading biologic width. So sounding during tooth preparation for biologic width determination is important. This is a normal crest patient. Wentz Orban and Gargiulo defined the biologic width model in 1961. There are variations because not everybody follows the Wentz Orban and Gargiulo model. Some patients have a low crest situation, which means the biologic width is greater than two. Those patients are highly susceptible to recession. High crest patients where the biologic width is less than two because the bony crest is closer to the free gingival margin, those people are resistant to recession. But if you never sound when you prep, you never know what you're dealing with. On a low crest patient, I would plan for a subgingival margin because when you retract, when you take your impression, you're going to get some recession. And if aesthetics is important, if the tooth is dark, you want to have a subgingival margin, you need to plan for it on a low crest. Foundation restorations. We, this is a situation with we deal every day, taking off old restorations and replacing them due to recurrent decay or other issues. Here you can see these restorations have been removed. The previous dentist did not really shape the teeth or prepare the teeth, just dug and gouged out the teeth and made a finish line and put a crown on it. That's not what we're taught in school. We're taught to rebuild the internal form through foundations. Foundations not only help increase retention and the quality of the, the fit of the crown, but these foundations also help protect and preserve the integrity of the pulp and the tooth structure underneath the crown. Sometimes we take out an old filling and we have a crack. We don't know whether that crack or fracture extends to the pulp or not. We now also have biologically active materials that we can use for buildups. This is biodentin. Biodentin is tricalcium phosphate. Tricalcium phosphate can be used uh, over a direct pulp exposure. So this is a bioactive buildup material that would be, in my opinion, indicated for the situation that you see on the top. Replacement restorations has provided most dentists with a lot of work over the period of years. And that's because, uh, in, at least in this situation, you can see uh, inadequate preparation leading to inadequate thickness of restorative material 
and fractures under occlusal stress over time. You know, we, we're not doing the patient any favors by conserving tooth structure if we don't allow for proper thickness of material for strength. There just isn't enough space here for metal and ceramic to provide both of those for this tooth. So how conservative is it when we have to keep cutting things off and redoing? We want to have a uniform thickness and replace the natural anatomy of the tooth, yet still uh, have a preparation that is protective in function. Now, removing zirconia. Here's an anterior case with zirconia cores and Emacs baked. Um, I don't know of any burr that magically takes off zirconia today, although we have some companies that claim that these burrs are designed for better cutting of zirconia. Um, for the young dentists out there, I'm glad I'm an old dentist because you're going to have to cut off all the zirconia restorations that fail that all of us older dentists place and then retire and don't have to worry about it anymore. I really seriously think that's going to be an issue. Now, the zirconia is getting to be a better material aesthetically. It certainly can provide a good marginal seal. It's one that needs to be replaced for any reason. We still have that problem, and the problem is effective removal. The reason zirconium is beginning, beginning to get a lot of popularity is because of CAD CAM and milling, and the cost of these restorations can be significantly less to the dentist than a traditional porcelain to gold, porcelain to metal, which is why a lot of people are going toward this type of restoration. This is a patient that had 10 zirconia uh, restorations. I spent two hours and probably conservatively 20 diamond burrs cutting these restorations off to redo the case. Single tooth restoration. Let's look at preparation. I was taught in dental school to prepare wrong, I think. We were taught all about the margin. It's not just about the margin. You got to make the tooth smaller, but in anatomic form, so that you replace the lost anatomy with a uniform thickness of restorative material. I believe in depth cuts. You will see that in the, the rest of our webinar. I'm going to go a little bit faster here because I want you to see, you know, sequential preparation, depth cutting the cervical half or the sizal half first and creating a finish line, which won't be a finish line, but changing the axis of inclination, and then changing or, or preparing the second plane, which is the uh, cervical plane. Using a gauge, this is PrepSure from Contact EZ, to make sure I've got two, two millimeters of thickness, as the restoration here is going to be an Emacs um, full coverage crown with buildup foundation, as you see. Here's a case I did from years ago. Typical, what happens when preparation is underprepared and the porcelain is not thick enough? The porcelain fractures. Here are provisional restorations I placed, did a little bit of surgery on the first molar on the upper, the provisionals after healing. Originally cutting off that upper first molar, there is not enough occlusal clearance for metal and porcelain, period. This is one of the most frequent causes of restorative failure that as a dentist I see. And we blame it on the material. It's not the material, it's the lack of preparation. Make sure there is a millimeter to millimeter and a half of space. Here you can see the porcelain is a couple of tenths thick. Porcelain was not designed, and this is the structural stress bearing area of the restoration, the occlusal surface. It doesn't matter if the porcelain's thicker here. This is the area where the restoration fails, and it's failed because of inadequate preparation. So repreparation, new impressions. These are the provisional restorations fit on the die. That means the temporaries fit good. That's the subject of one of our future webinars, because again, in dental school, there is not enough emphasis on a good fitted provisional. They told us in school, don't make the temporaries look too good, the patients don't come back. These are diagnostic prototypes for the final restorations, which you see here in bisbake form, on the restorative models, on the master models, and then in the patient. So the crown down technique is what I talk about. You've got two planes of reduction on the facial, three on the lingual on an anterior, 
two planes of reduction on posterior, facial, and lingual. Follow the natural anatomy of the tooth. Here's the, the, the palatal side of an upper central incisor, three distinct planes. This part of the tooth is often underprepared by the dentist. I'm preparing a depth cut here, and then I use an elliptical burr to create the concavity, which you see here, so that when you see a cross section of the restoration, you see the natural anatomic form, uniform thickness of material and the stress bearing areas. Here's the occlusal contact in this area and a nice thickness of porcelain for aesthetics on the front. Following the reduction. Step is going to be able to. I'm going to show a couple of videos right here. Just a couple of things. We're into the 935 here. We've got about another 10 minutes. But just to show the burr moving, I'm breaking contact. It's the first thing I do when prepping multiple teeth. Then over here, you can see in incisal view, we're going to make our depth cuts. First in the incisal half, and then in the cervical half, and then join the depth cuts. So I'm putting the burr into about approximately the radius. This burr is 1.2 millimeters in diameter. If I want to make a, a preparation that's a millimeter or slightly less, I'm going to use a thinner burr and make my depth cut so that once I remove the tooth structure between the depth cuts, I'm not over prepared. On the lower slide, you're seeing the lingual groove, the central groove, the central uh, depth groove being cut to maintain the, the anatomic form plus give me uh, three planes of reduction that I will then take the elliptical burr and remove the tooth structure on each side to prepare the lingual surface of that lateral incisor. This is something you'll never see in dental school and dentists won't show you, but this is a nice little trick to make sure you've got a smooth margin with no little lip because you may have a a little enamel projection right here because the shape of the burr is rounded. And you don't see that until you retract the tissue away and see that little lip, and that has to be removed. Technicians call that the J margin. That margin will break in the dye and will cause you to have an open margin in your restoration. I always do a preoperative wax up, and from that wax up, I'll make some type of preparation guide. This preparation guide may be out of uh, addition silicone, which you'll see here, which I make some cuts in, and then I can get a three-dimensional idea of where the final restorative will be, again, as a checks and balance here to make sure I have enough reduction in these critical areas. So again, break the contact, half the diameter, depth cuts, Incisal will have first, remove the tooth structure between the depth cuts, change the angle of the burr, depth cuts in the cervical half, remove the tooth structure between the depth cuts, two planes of reduction. Incisal reduction on an anterior, 1 to 1.5. Incisal edge on an upper incisor forms an acute plane because the lower side of the length is going to come downward and forward. It's the opposite or a lower. Lingual preparation, depth groove down the center of the tooth following the lingual concavity, and then take out the elliptical burr and remove the tooth structure on each side of the depth cut. I always smooth my preparations with a fine diamond. The smoother the prep, the better. In today's world of CAD CAM, even more important to have a smooth preparation. I'm using the elliptical, elliptical burr to smooth the palatal surface. And then my last step is to use an enhance point. This is a composite polishing point, but it's going to smooth the prep and round the edges to make sure that I have a nice, smooth die as my final preparation. Okay, we got a fast poll. 
We do indeed. Okay, folks, we have one more quick Notice question. That finish line line was the shoulder, <laughs> a rounded shoulder. That's right. That's right. And we touched on margins too. Let's uh, open up a quick question and say, where should margins be? Do we placed? have a fast call there, Rich? We do. Coming right up. If you're going to be placing a a margin in thinking about gingival health, where should you keep that margin? Let's hear your feedback. Oh, here we go. Where should the margins be placed to keep the gingiva as healthy as possible? Oh, I can't hear you because I probably had you on mute. Can I hear you now? Are you there? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> I wonder, where'd he go? He's right here. Answers are coming fast and furious. We're going to leave it open just for a few more moments, folks, so we can make sure to leave time for Dr. Lowe to address your questions just in a few moments. And I'll answer the question then when the answers come in because the answer is obvious to me when it's just about health. Okay, I'm going to leave it just for a couple more seconds. Counting down, we've got about 10 more seconds if you want to make sure your answer is heard, folks. You should play the uh, final Jeopardy music here. I've got <laughs> that at my computer somewhere for next time. All right, here's what our results look like. About what you would have expected, I think, right? At the gingival crest, slightly above? Well, if, if the answer is totally on health, the answer in my mind would be above. Now, can you put it above and be aesthetic at the same time? Depends. A felspathic veneer with today's porcelain, you can keep the margin slightly above the tissue if the tooth is light and you can blend the ceramic and you got a, t a talented technician. At the level of the tissue would be the next obvious choice. The only reason I go under the tissue today is if I have a short prep and I need additional retention, or if I have a dark prep and I need to mask the darkness of the color to have an aesthetic result. When I started in this profession 30 years ago, the answer was subgingival 100% of the time. So you see, times have changed, materials have changed. Now we're going to tackle a little on incisal gingival height, one of the questions we've already got from the audience. So we'll tackle that in a little bit more detail in just a few moments. Okay. Well, let's look at a, let's look at a, 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 a fixed partial uh, in the posterior. And, and here's a typical situation where we have a, a first molar that's been lost, and we've got slight angulation of the preparations, which need to be accounted for when you prepare to get line of draw. Now, I follow the same rules when I prepare posterior teeth. Even more importantly, depth cut up to two millimeters to create clearance. Now, in this case, with this old amalgam restoration in the molar, I may or may not replace that. I've got no qualms whatsoever about replacing those and doing buildups in these teeth. Uh, and sometimes I do it at the preparation and provisional. Sometimes I do it at the uh, final stage. It just depends. But right now, we're doing depth cuts so that you can see uh, the depth cuts of the facial, the, the, the depth of the central groove. This is an area that's traditionally underprepared. I'm from the state of Illinois. I'll tell you, most time I look at posterior preparations by dentists, they look like Abe Lincoln's top hats. That's not the way teeth are shaped. If you wanna have the depth of the central groove and heights of cusp and actual, actual anatomy in your restoration, you need to prepare the occlusal surface properly. Depth cuts 1 to 1.5 to 2 following natural anatomic contour. And reduce the lingual in the same fashion. Next, we go to the facial surface. Occlusal half, depth cut. You see a temporary shoulder there. Now we do the cervical reduction. So we have two planes of reduction. Remember, the prepared cusp tips should be in line with the unprepared cusp tips. Prepping like Abe Lincoln's top hat leaves crowns that have too wide of occlusal tables, too broad of contacts, non-anatomic, and too much function. And hard, impossible to clean. Do the same thing then on the lingual. Occlusal half gingival half. 
then look at opposing. Now, even though this tooth is probably going to be restored later, we don't know with this patient. I recommended leveling the clusal plane and doing a crown up here. I may do a little bit of a gingivoplasty up here to make room, but I'm certainly going to make sure that whatever I do in here to correct the occlusal plane, there's going to be enough clearance here, and it's not going to be affected by this tooth. If I have to do an adjustment on here and polish it, I will, knowing that at some point in time that will be restored. So here's where we started. Here's where we finish. Now you can take this material out and do your buildup, take your impression. The axial preparation is 1 to 1.5. Margin location, intracravicular on this case, the restoration we were doing was a porcelain fused to metal. This is CapTech. The patient wasn't really sure which end of the toothbrush had the bristles, so we decided to go slightly subgingival. Now, sequential preparation, this is an aesthetic case. We've got diastomas, we've got width length, we've got uh, tooth width discrepancies that we're dealing with. So step one, I'm breaking all the proximal contacts. We have uh, diminutive lateral incisors, so we, we use all of our uh, um, knowledge of uh, smile design and golden proportion and those types of things. Incisal reduction, I said, remember, 1.5. Use a depth cut of 1.5 from a cylinder burr. Do the incisal reduction. And then do the depth cuts on the facial half, uh, first, or the incisal half first on the facial. Remove the structure between the depth cuts. Place the depth cuts in the cervical. I like these views because you see the teeth in half preparation. You can see how the tooth preparation is following the natural anatomy of the unprepared tooth because that particular finish line is uniform in thickness. Now I change the direction of the burr and make a depth cut there and reduce the second plane. You can see that happening. Depth cuts down here. Remove the tooth structure between the depth cuts. And now you have two planes of reduction. You can see one, two, one, two, one, two. Lingual groove, the depth groove on the lingual right down the center. And then using the elliptical burr to prepare the, the lingual concavities. That third plane We'll, be go, we'll switch back to the uh, rounded cylinder to create the, the plane that wraps around the cingulum, which you see here. So we've got uniform thickness of the margin all the way around, following the natural anatomic form of the tooth. I can't tell you how many teeth I see grossly underprepared when removing old restorations on the lingual on the lingual proximal and on the uh, lingual margin directly um, opposing the cingulum or adjacent to the cingulum. Always check for clearance. Check for clearance and excursions, not just centric. Polish the preparations with a 30 micron burr and an enhanced point. Round the margins. Porcelain doesn't like sharp, obtrusive angles. Here's where we started. Here's where we finished with these preparations. These are 360 degree because we have to make up space. I don't feel it's good dentistry to put veneers on the front of teeth to close spaces and leave big gaps behind. Here's where we started. Here's preparation. Here's restoration. This is one of my patients we did this for almost 15 years ago. So discussion. We can talk about Rush. We can talk about music. Rich, <laughs> you got some questions? Yes, sir. Let's start off with this one. Uh, I have a question from the audience. For a single tooth crown prep, do you parallel your contacts? That is, take a disc to the interproximal surfaces of the adjacent teeth to achieve a broader contact to make delivery easier and more hygienic? It's a great question. 
I'll tell you a short story. I worked with a guy that took a disc to a tooth once and ended up cutting a tongue in half. I never take a disc to a tooth. I'm not going to broaden the contact. Contacts in the posterior should be elliptical. They should be point or they should be elliptical contacts located to the buckle of the central groove. So the answer is no. I don't make contacts larger and broader. To me, that doesn't make seating easier. It makes cleansability more difficult. Stick to your anatomy and what you learn, and don't alter that. If you have a, 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 an, a, an adjacent tooth that's out of alignment or whatever, certainly there is always the, the, the opportunity to, to correct the axial alignment, either by doing an enameloplasty that you can then polish, or by restoring that tooth as well, which whatever it needs to correct that proximal alignment prior to doing your full coverage on the adjacent tooth. Excellent. That other question I mentioned that uh, we touched on almost in brief while you were going through the didactic portion, Dr. Lowe, if you don't have enough incisal gingival height for a prep, uh, you're thinking about maybe some resistance form that you're pursuing there, how do you handle? You talked a little about the margin. What about, the, what about your approach Do you configure in a short incisal gingival height? Good question, because I tell you, most dentists don't even consider the answer number one is crown lengthening. Take a look at your x-ray. How much tooth is above the gum? How much tooth is below the gum? Now, patients won't always do a surgery, but I always tell them that uh, once you get past that minimum incisal height, incisal gingival height of three millimeters, you're compromising the resistance and retention form of any restoration. There is no cement that we can bond to a flat stump. So if you've got a short cervical incisal prep, the first thing I do is look how much tooth is under the tissue and consider a surgical approach to reposition the tissue and gain more height of, of the tooth to prepare. The second would be, you know, if we're on the cusp, so to speak, we got 2.5 and we only need another half in the, the, the margin or the, 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 the probable sulcus depth is three, well, then I consider an intracravicular or subgingival margin to gain another half a millimeter of axial height to make up that difference. So it's a combination of using the sulcular depth wisely, but only up to about 50%. Don't violate biologic width. If you're getting down below 50% of that sulcular depth, the recommendation is crown lengthening. Or make the contacts real tight and tell the patient that gravity will affect it if it's an upper. That's Got a it. joke. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Uh, do you remove an existing restoration like that amalgam before or after crown prep? Like in that case well, that's a good showed. question, and the answer is yes. I mean, and when, I, when I've got an old amalgam that I placed, that I know that I cleaned it out, and now years later for whatever, a tooth fracture or what have you, I'm not as apt to take it out immediately. I'll prep it, and if the margins are clean, I may elect to leave it if it's still a sound, marginally competent um, uh, core. If not, if it's somebody else that did it, and I don't know what's under the bottom, if there's evidence of decay or the margins are are, are not good, in other words, uh, incompetent because of, of poor fit, I'll take it out and build the core out immediately. So it's, it's case dependent on when that decision is made. There have been some times when I've, I've been conservative not to take out a small uh, piece of old filling material that I've placed previously, and then at the impression appointment, I decided, oh, you know what, I'm just going to do it, and I take the temporary off, do my core, and then take my impression. So it's going to be a case-dependent thing, but I will tell you this. You can't go wrong by removing any old core and replacing it. Is there a certain measurement that you go by in order to determine if you want to close an anterior contact with a veneer or a crown when you're deciding between those two? It's not really a measurement. It really is it has to do with the contour of the existing tooth relative to both the facial surface and the lingual surface. I've seen too many people try to be quote unquote conservative and just do a facial veneer and then have patients end up with class three uh, composite uh, restorations in the lingual because of either crowding or, or poor contours or places that 
are, are very difficult to maintain effective home care. Think about it. It's not just the number of microns of enamel you can serve. The patient also has to be able to maintain what you do. So it, one of the things Dr. Chevelle always said was many teeth are sacrificed on the altar of false conservatism. It's not conservative to shortcut your prep and, and have a long-term uh, difficulty with maintenance, function, or any other thing. Cut your losses at the beginning, do sound dentistry, create uh, proper thicknesses and proper contours, and whatever you do that first time has a much better chance for long-term success. We touched on zirconia crowns very briefly. Um, what's your approach, your instrumentation? Is it a diamond that's your normal? What's your handpiece selection when you're cutting into a, a really dense material like a zirconia crown? Oh, are you talking about removing them? Yeah. First, I, I, I pray to the zirconia gods, and then I take out an electric, because electric has constant torque. How much do you want to spend on handpiece repair? If you beat the heck out of an air turbine, trying to get these things off day after day, it's going to really damage your handpiece long term. If you don't have an electric, consider getting an electric. I have an electric and an air rotor on every delivery unit. The electrics will, will deliver constant torque, so they will be less damaging to the instrument, removing something as dense and difficult as zirconia. Now, some people are of the school of thought that using a finer diamond to cut through zirconia allows you to cut quicker. Some say using a coarse diamond. I don't know the answer to that. All I will do is tell you this. I don't like it when I have to cut off a zirconia restoration. Sometimes I do. Uh, and, and it may be, depending upon the thickness of that restoration, I'll go through anywhere from five to ten good diamonds to get that crown off. Wow. So think about that. <laughs> what type of margin? Do you vary your approach at all? If you have a patient who has a high lip line when you're working in the anterior, do you any, does that influence your margin selection at all? Uh, patients with high lip lines, sometimes. First thing I ask to them about, you know, I've, I've seen patients with high lip lines that have, uh, you know, root recession, and they don't care that they got yellow roots showing and teeth above them. So uh, for them, I don't necessarily – cover everything that's above the pink. I mean, it, these are going to be questions you need to ask on their uh, on uh, what their approach is to uh, their aesthetic outcome. If their aesthetic outcome is such that you're doing something with a high lip line and they don't like that, then you may need a combined approach with the periodontist to, to, to do some uh, gingival surgery to level things out. Maybe you shorten teeth so that you don't have to make teeth look so long and you cover the roots to the existing height of the tissue or you do some grafting. I mean, there are so many different variables that, that my best advice is to talk to your patient, find out if it really matters, because for some it does and some it don't. And, and some actually plastic surgeons can adjust lip lines by doing some type of uh, uh, surgeries inside or, you know, from removing alveolar tissue or uh, alveolar mucosa, pulling the lip down or doing fillers and other types of ways to hide that high, uh, high smile line. So it varies from case to case. Look at all your solutions and decide which is best for you and your patient. This next question I have to pose, I know because I asked you this question just the other evening as well, but what's your preferred temporary material uh, for a crown? What's your temporization technique these days? Well, do we have another hour? Because <laughs> <laughs> now we're opening up the next course. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. I just started agree. the days of the methyl methacrylate. That's, that's a material that's gone by the wayside. We have a lot, lot of good temporary provisional materials out there. Most of them are bisacryls that have been, uh, like composites, improved over the time. Um, early bisacryls, the knock on them was because of their brittleness. You really couldn't do long spans. Uh, some people still use uh, a laboratory process provisionals, which for long-term uh, provisionalization, not a bad way to go. Uh, one company makes a rubberized urethane, which is a not a bisacryl, which is more uh, uh, impact resistant, so another selection for long-term temporization. And then some of the newer provisional materials out are now using nanofillers in that because, you know, people are realizing that you should make the temporary look good and patients are demanding it. So you want to have a material that polishes well and looks good. 
So the, the answer to your question is, I don't have one provisional material that I prefer. I have about three or four, depending upon the shade, depending upon whether it's aesthetics or long-term. And the technique is pretty much the same. It's an indirect technique. I either have a, a pre-operative wax up or mop up made with composite on a, a model that's adjusted so that I, I can make a, a, a either a putty stent or a suck down from that, that once I prepare the teeth, I fill that with the provisional material after lubricating the teeth to allow for easy removal, place the stent over the teeth for the appropriate time, then remove it, carve it, and um, finish the margins and, and cement it. So it's an indirect technique, but it's done chair side. I usually don't use a laboratory process unless I find some real need to, and that's one and I can't remember the last time I ordered a lab process. Uh, I feel that uh, people that use lab presses all the time, if you like that, that's great. I find I adjust them more to get them to fit properly. Uh, it's a lot quicker for me to do a custom right from the beginning. Got it. Do we have time for a couple of quick more, uh, a couple of quick ones before we break for the evening? Were you asking me? Yes, sir. I've got a couple more that are coming in. I've got, I've got nothing but time. Okay. Well, then one of the questions, uh, we mentioned that uh, your, your practice has some exposure to CAD CAM crowns, and uh, I know that you use the, the term smooth. I'm, I'm smoothing my, my prep to account smoothing for the CAD CAM. Smoothing and preps, right. Yeah. Do you, do, do you make any other adjustments to your prep technique for specifically CAD CAM crowns? There are a couple of different schools of thought on that. First of all, I don't use chair side milling. I'm not against it. I think chair side milling is one good option. Um, for indirect technique. I still use a laboratory process for, for the majority of my restorations, although some of them are made from traditional impressions and some of them are made from, from uh, um, cameras or, uh, you know, uh, optical, uh, optical impressions. Uh, remember, though, the difference when you make an optical impression, it's still a picture. It's 2D, which is why I think that the preparation design is even more critical that, it, that irregularities are even more of a problem. So if you're using, you know, today's scanners, uh, and, and, you know, these are starting to become popular, um, make sure your preparations, I think, should be smooth, the margins very distinct, the very no irregularities. And if you do that, you'll have a better uh, result because of the, of, the, of the technique that they're made. They're made from... Um, they're made from optical information. Literally can be made without a dye. Uh, the difference uh, on a traditional is, you know, you pour up the impression, you have a physical three-dimensional dye. If you have a good margin, you can follow it. Both techniques, I've used both. Uh, I think uh, an, an optical impression in the CAD CAM world today, I think, that, to me, the biggest advantage is not necessarily how I take the impression, although Capturing an impression with a, an optical scanner is, is good for a patient that gags, that can't take conventional impression, if you have trouble with access and all that. It doesn't preclude you from proper tissue management, getting rid of the saliva and the blood, because if you got that around, it, it doesn't matter. Your impression's not going to be accurate. Your restoration's not going to fit. Optical impressions usually use some type of polyurethane or, or system to make the dye. The dyes are extremely accurate. And I think the dyes are uh, in the model work is really one big plus on using a CAD CAM technique. Um, now that doesn't mean that, you know, another way that uh, uh, we're, we're getting into the uh, digital workflow using a traditional impression is through a scanners. Companies are coming out now with little scanners for $3,000 that you have in your office. You take your impression, put it in the scanner, turn the impression into optical data, and then that goes to a lab where the lab can fabricate a, a polyurethane or whatever model and a restoration from that. So a lot of exciting things um, yeah, for sure. are, are, are really making our, our profession. Uh, um, uh, the one thing about the older dentist like me, uh, and, and older even than I, um, the profession has changed so much in the last 20 to 30 years, it keeps it always interesting and exciting. And for the younger dentists, you've got nothing but great things to look forward to, I think. Uh, the economic challenges might be a little bit different. I know that they're different than they are for me than they were from when I started practice and 
different for the dentist in the 60s when they first hung out their shingle and they uh, started getting people with insurance and it actually uh, financially worked. I mean, economic times change and there are always challenges, but the actual delivery of the service that we provide, I think is one of the exciting healthcare professions that we have to deal with today. That's great. One more just before we finish for the evening, folks. Uh, what's the best way to remove existing composite without sacrificing tooth structure? Tip number one, if you're working without magnification, get that fixed right now. If you're using 2.5 loops, I've always said 2.5 is for wusses. I meant that. 2.5, even when I had younger eyes, did not magnify enough. I've used 4.0 since I was a dental student back in my early 30s, late 20s, early 30s. I still use 4.0. So the number one thing, if you want to take out a composite, differentiate it between two, is use magnification. You won't have a problem. It's the same thing about cutting off a, a, a tooth-colored crown. You know, you can literally cut down so you see that little color of dent. You know, people say, oh, every time you take, you take away a lot of healthy teeth. Well, nonsense. You don't have to do that if you're careful and you can see what you're doing. So that, to me, is the number one thing. Um, okay, last question for the night then. For a full zirconia crown in the posterior, you're going to take a traditional impression and send it to the lab for fabrication. Would that be, in your world, is that a heavy chamfer or a shoulder margin that's dictating your choice there? That's a great question because there's still a little bit of controversy on whether you can prepare zirconia like gold or whether you should prepare it like porcelain. So the answer would be yes. The bigger question is this. Most teeth, at least in my experience, that I prepare for zirconia are not virgin teeth. Most of those teeth have had existing restorations. What is the number one thing that, de that, that determines what your margin will be? The number one thing is what was there to begin with. If there was already a big wide shoulder, guess what? You can't make it smaller. It is what it is. So uh, a, a lot of these back teeth that I'm finding go to zirconia have either had previous crowns on them that have broken or have large fillings on them that once you take them out, You've got to look at feral effects. You've got to look at other things. You've got to grab for more tooth. So, again, it's going to be – there's no cut and dry answer. We're not preparing virgin teeth here. You've got to look at what you've got, what is core, what is old filling, what is healthy tooth, how much is above the gum, how much is below the gum. Do you have feral? But we haven't talked about feral. Feral, a two-millimeter feral effect is required for retention. So you, if you don't have two millimeters of tooth structure above the finish line, you don't have feral effect, and that could adversely affect the retention and the ability of the crown um, not to just break off at, at uh, some type of angle. So um, on, a, on a zirconium, all things being equal, I, I'm kind of cutting my differences now. I'm not doing a real heavy shoulder. I'm not doing a, a knife edge or a, a mini chamfer. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting those mostly with a millimeter. Uh, round, rounded internal shoulder with a 90-degree butt joint that you know. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. We appreciate the Q&A and, and all of our attendees. Thank you for your insightful questions. Uh, I think that I got a feeling that they were well-received by our speaker this evening and, and interesting to him on a couple of different levels. Um, he'd tell you that living in the limelight is the universal dream. So uh, we thank you for sharing that. Way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just advancing us one more slide, Dr. Lowe, just so I can send our folks on their way tonight. Series we'd love, yeah, we'd love for you to, to come back on, on a very uh, unmemorable night, October 31st. We know you have other things uh, fighting for your attention on the 31st, but we'd love for you to come join Glenn Williams. He's going to be talking about maintaining your handpiece and some of the things that will help you uh, ergonomically down the road as you continue to uh, make your way into the profession. and. On your behalf tonight, the attendees, Dr. Lowe, we really want to thank you for, for sharing your knowledge with us this evening, a really insightful presentation. Uh, we'd like to extend that thanks to NSK for making this series possible and for their sponsorship of this event. And for all of you who joined us on a, a busy Tuesday evening, thank you so much for your time, your questions, and your attention. Uh, we hope you will take a few moments just to share your thoughts 
in the post-event survey, and we'll hope you come back for the, the final element in the series. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Lowe, big hand. And best of luck to everybody, and like the, the old guy from Hill Street Blues used to say before he let all the police go out on the street, be careful out there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.